Hello, so yeah, we're very pleased that um, Enric Frago has agreed to do um, the seminar today, um, at quite short notice, which is great. Um, so Frago did his PhD, Enric Frago did his PhD at the University of Valencia, looking at population dynamics in moths. Then yes. he moved on to white moths. Then he moved on to a postdoc at Oxford, um, and then a Marie Curie postdoc at um, Wageningen in um, Holland where he was looking at interactions between um, herbivores, the host plants, um, their symbionts and um, natural predators, looking at related questions at um, uh, how symbiont mediated protection in mites and how symbiont mediated protection acts via plant volatiles. It, uh, five years ago, four or five years ago, Frago got a permanent position at CIRAD and he's now looking at related questions with thrips and whiteflies. So thank you very much, Gregor. Yeah. Okay. So can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All good. Can I can I start? Sure. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Maybe before you start, so if if uh, people have questions, you can use the Q and A tab that you will find at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions already during the talk, and uh, we'll okay. ask them afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, perfect. Yeah. Um, so, thank you very much, um, Alison, for the presentation. Um, as, as you have my, my full screen, when I get into the next slide, I will tell you like something like next. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as Alison said, uh, my name is Enrique Frago, um, and I will present you today uh, work that we did in collaboration with Sharon Zitinska from the University of Liverpool, um, which is a meta-analysis on the benefits and costs of hosting secondary endosymbionts in sap-sucking insects. And this work was done by Sharon and myself, and also by Karim Tihiwart, which is a who is a student uh, doing the PhD with with me at this moment. And Karim and myself, we are both at CIRAT, which is the French uh, research center for research in agriculture in in, uh, in tropical countries. Um, this project, uh, there's a mouse moving around. Maybe Alison, stop moving your mouse. If not, it's a bit disturbing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, so this project is the is the product of a of a cost action, which was a five year project uh, from the European Union. Cost actions are uh, projects that are that fund um, networks of scientists around Europe. In our cost action was about insect plant microbe interactions, and Sharon and myself were in charge of the microbes living inside the insects, which is this uh, this meta analysis. Um, next. <laughs> Yeah, so we are now, uh, now more and more aware of the importance of microbiota for, for, for all animals. We know now that we cannot understand the biology of animals without understanding the microbes that live inside. For example, in humans, we have our guts full of and skin full of microbes. And there's quite some uh, recent studies, but also quite some older ones. For example, this one about microbiome and obesity, where the researchers selected couples of, uh, of uh, twins, one with a problem of obesity, the other one without. And by transferring the microbiota of these two persons into a mice, they managed to transfer this obesity problem, which shows that the obesity problem was not the genetic background of the person because they were twins, but the microbiota. So in the future, do not get surprised if your doctor gives you a poo pill, which is a pill with the healthy microbiota of a healthy person that can help you fight uh, diseases like, for example, uh, the Clostridium difficile variants that are resistant to antibiotics. Um, our skin smells, and this can attract mosquitoes that, are, that can transmit uh, lethal diseases. And this smell can be also mediated by the microbes in our skin. And even sexual communication and hygiene has been found to be caused uh, mediated by microbes. Next. But let's move on and talk about insects now. So insect symbionts can be bacteria, fungi, and protozoans. And I will mostly talk about bacteria because it's the group that we have done more work. But there's uh, some recent exciting uh, evidences about fungi and protozoans. So this symbiotic association with hosts, they, hosts, they have been 
happening in all known taxa because they are uh, quite important sources of phenotypic innovation. For example, the symbionts can allow an insect to fit on a new host plant, and this can open a new niche for this insect. Or, for example, these uh, symbionts can protect uh, their host from natural enemies, so these insects they can colonize um, new habitat that were before too dangerous for them. So they can be the source of diversification. Um, together with Shannon, uh, Zitinska, and also Nina Faturus in Wageningen, we recently published a book chapter. I take the advantage to invite you to read it. <laughs> um, so where we did the revision on how symbionts uh, affect the, the biology of herbivorous insects. In the last five years, there's been like tons of reviews on insect symbiosis. And when we wanted to write this review, we didn't know what to do because there was already too many reviews. So we decided to do an order by order revision. So we went each order and we talk about these orders and what's what's known in their symbionts. So with hope, it's a reference that can be used for people that says, I don't care too much about insects, but I want to know what's inside Dipterans, and then you go to the specific uh, section of the chapter. So, for example, in Amipterans, you can see that I marked it with a red arrow, which is the group I will talk about. We know today, we know that the simons can provide nutrition, they can uh, help in degrading uh, the cell walls in plants, but they can also suppress plant defenses and they can also be play important roles in defense against natural enemies. Next. Thank you, Alison. Um, so um, today I will talk about phloem feeders, which are mostly emipterans and commonly known as aphids, wipes, white flies, psyllids, and mealybugs. Why, why uh, this group of insects? Well, this group of insects, they have acquired obligatory symbionts, all of them, and each big group of insects have acquired a particular symbiont. So we could not understand the biology of these groups today without their symbionts. For example, all aphids carry Bugnera. And these symbionts provide their insects with essential, essential amino acids that the insect could, cannot acquire from the, from the diet. Um, so as, as I've said, when these groups evolved and acquired these symbionts, uh, this is when they diversified in, um, in, in, in our planet. So, on top, uh, next, uh, sorry. So, these symbionts, as I've said, they provide essential nutrients. They are inside bacteriomes, which are kind of organs, uh, well, where the bacteria are well packed inside the host. But on top of these obligatory symbionts, facultative sim um, uh, these phloem feeders also carry, also carry facultative endosymbionts that can be found in bacteriums or not, but interestingly, that they provide conditional benefits. They provide benefits in some situations, and they are not always present. They are not always in all populations of a species. This is why we are interested in them in this meta-analysis, because doing a meta-analysis on obligatory symbionts would be quite stupid because the fitness effects of losing the symbiont is always the same. The insect dies. But in endosymbionts, we can try to evaluate the costs and the benefits of these symbionts. Next. So here an example that I always present when I talk about these symbionts is the Asian citrus psyllid. You can see on the top left picture, there's this the whole insect. In the abdomen, you see a yellow uh, organ, which is not an organ, is a microbiome, um, or a microbiome, um, is a package of symbionts that if we cut it sagittally, we can see on the, on the right side, we can see that this bacterium has two different layers, one external, which is carsonella, that provides essential amino acids, and one internal, which is profitella, which provides, produces toxins, and these toxins are thought to make the insect toxic and protect it against natural enemies. Next. So um, in white flies too, we know there's quite some um, facultative symbionts like Hamiltonella, which is uh, depicted in green, or Arsenophonus in yellow. If you take a look at the bottom right picture, you can see a white fly and you can see in the abdomen a yellow spot, which is the bacterium. So this is to show you that this these symbionts are not somewhere in the insect. They are located in very specific uh, parts of the insect 
they are transmitted from mother to offspring because the symbiont colonizes the embryos and they are vertically transmitted. So the evolutionary destiny of the host and the bacteria are very tightly connected. Next one. So if we take a look at aphids, this is another paper by, by Sharon and his collaborator, collaborator, yeah, um, who explored how, uh, how many um, insect species were carrying a facultative symbionts. So you can see on the left side of the slide um, all these different symbionts that we know facultative, eh? uh, the obligatory is Bugner and it's not, it's always present, of these facultative symbionts. And we, you can see in the graph in yellow how many species carry a given symbiont and in red how many in yellow, how many species do not carry the simeon, sorry, and in red, how many species do carry the simeon. And you see that, for example, Volkbachia is present in almost half the population, half uh, the species of aphids studied, studied, whereas Hamiltonian is only in one third. But then it's important to know, again, huh? Even if one species carries Hamiltonella, not all populations of the species will carry the symbiont. Next. <clears throat> so if you go a bit more in detail of the, uh, of the P aphid example, so aphids are a good model system for symbiosis because they are easy to culture, um, easy to manipulate, and the P aphid is probably the, the aphid model for symbiosis. As all aphid, it carries Bugnera, but it also carries several, several different facultative symbionts. Of course, they are not always, not all symbionts are found in the same individual. Usually, P. aphids carry no facultative symbionts. One symbiont is maybe the most probable situation. Two is quite normal. More than two is possible, but quite rare. But among these seven symbionts, we can have, for example, Regella insecticola, um, which provides protection against fungal pathogens, Hamiltonella defense that protects against parasitoids, and Serratia symbiotica that protects against uh, heat shocks. You can see in the picture on the right side of the slide, you can see a parasitic wasp that is laying an egg inside a little baby aphid, um, and this egg will develop into a larvae that will eventually kill the aphid. But if this aphid carries some strains of Hamiltonella, the aphid will be immune to this, to this uh, the larvae will never develop into adult. Next. So I've talked about three different groups of flow and feeding insects, but there's also an important group of flow and feeding insects, which are heteropterans, including sting bugs, shield bugs, and true bugs. In these groups, the associations with symbionts are a bit less intimate. The symbionts are not found inside the body, but in the digestive tract. And uh, if I've said that in aphids and whiteflies, the transmission is via the embryo, and in these groups, vertical transmission is a bit more complicated. For example, in Megacopta punctatissima, Megacopta cribaria, the mother, when the mother lays the eggs, it deposits a group of symbiotic particles. You can see them in the picture in the left side. You can see in white the eggs, in yellow the babies, and in black the symbiont capsules. So when the offspring gets out, the, this, this offspring needs to pick up the, the symbionts to acquire them. So this is much less reliable than transmitting it through the embryo. If I was a mother and I want to ensure that my, my son has the symbiont, I would prefer to transfer it through the egg in the embryo than doing this uh, weird thing. But this is why these associations are less intimate. For example, in the other side of the slide, you can see Ryptopterus pedestris, which is another sting bug. You can see in the bottom figure, you see in blue the, the, the gut of the insect, and in green is the simon. So it's found, even if they are, the association is not as intimate as in aphids, for example, you can see that there's a, there's the, 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 the gut of the insect is quite well colonized by this simon. And next. Another interesting thing with uh, flow and feeding insects is that we can manipulate symbionts. We can collect these insects in the field, assess which symbionts they carry. For example, in aphids, we can even establish uh, clonal lines because aphids can be kept reproducing asexually in the lab. And these lines can be cured from facultative symbionts using antibiotics. In aphids, we need to use antibiotics that kill the facultative but not the primary. If not, if we kill the primary, we kill the aphid too. 
Um, in aphids, we can even infect aphids with new symbionts via microinjection. We can take the symbiont from one species and transfer it to another one. In white flies, um, curing symbionts is difficult with antibiotics, so many studies have used introgression of symbionts via crossing. Basically, we have two lines, one with symbiont, the other with the other without, and we transfer the symbiont via and mating these two different lines and then by back crossing several times we try to homogenize the genetic background of the white flies so that we have one line with a cement and the other one without. Next. <clears throat> so yeah the over, overarching question of our study was that we know that these facultative symbionts provide benefits against abiotic stressors um, they can help them use new plants, they can protect them from pathogens, they can even change the color of the aphids, they can protect them against natural enemies. So if they are so useful, why they are not always there? So this is because they are often costly and these costs and benefits makes that um, carrying them is not always useful. And this is why we wanted to do this, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this meta-analysis. Next. So the three main questions I'll try to answer is which groups have been sufficiently experimentally examined for the effects of symbionts on the host. The second one is whether there is a trade-off between costs and benefits of symbionts. And the third one is whether the symbiont effects are species dependent. Next. So I am, I don't know which uh, it's, it's my first webinar, so I don't know the type of audience that is on the other side of the cable. So I don't know if you are all uh, familiar with uh, meta-analysis. So I will spend like a, a few slides trying to explain a little bit how meta-analysis works and how we did that. <coughs> Sorry. So a meta-analysis is basically a statistical analysis that combines the results of multiple, multiple scientific studies. So we started by looking for specific keywords in the web of science. Next. Um, for example, um, for the person passing the slides, now there's quite some next, but, uh, but then it's over. So don't worry too much. So for the keywords in the web of science, um, for the white, white flies, for example, we add always symbiont by the end, and then white flies and uh, common names um, as, as a common name, and then the most common genus that have been studied for, for white flies. And then based on this search, we establish several uh, selection criteria, next, <clears throat> which in our case was that these studies needed to experimentally test for symbiont effects using antibiotics, um, introgression and microinjections, as I've explained before. <clears throat> as in all meta-analyses, we need to obtain data and to fit our statistical models with this data. And we need that the authors of the paper reported the mean value, the standard error of this value and the number of replicates, because these are the data that we use to fit the statistical analysis. Next. Then, that's the most uh, painful part, which is extracting these mean values and these standard errors, which we did with a free program called Webplop Digitalizer, thanks to developers, by the way. And so we basically extracted these graphs from the papers and we measured the mean and the standard errors. Sometimes the data is in the text, so then it's very easy, you just copy paste, but sometimes you have to extract it from the from this uh, web plot digitizer. Next. So we were interested in few life history traits, including body size, development time, lifespan, fecundity, and survival and parasitism. This is the, the life history traits that we used to infer if carrying symbionts or not was, was uh, good for the insect or not. Then we calculated, we calculated, calculated standardized measures or effect sizes using the hedges D value, which is a classic uh, statistic, uh, classic value in, in meta-analysis. And basically this effect size is telling us from each data set, from each uh, paper, we have, if we have a positive effect, a positive effect size, it means that the symbiont was 
having something, doing something good to the insect. If the value was negative, it means that the effect was negative or a cost. And then we basically fit the program like, uh, like uh, similarly to a GLM model. And then we validated this model to assess if there was publication bias or p-hacking. P-hacking is when authors only publish when the p-values are lower than 0 0.05. Next. So let's go to the result. results now. Um, to answer the first question, which groups have been sufficiently experimentally examined for the effects of symbionts on the hosts? So you can see here a table where I represented the three groups we managed to get enough data, the heteropterans, the white flies and aphids. The first column is the number of papers we obtained from the web of science using our keywords. So like more than 1,000 papers. But some of these papers, just reading the abstract, you already knew that they were not interesting because they were, for example, uh, natural observations of symbionts in the wild without experimentation. experimentation. So these papers were already discarded. So after our criteria, we only end up with 13 papers from heteropterans, eight white flies, and 68 for aphids. And then the third column is the number of data points. Of course, there's more data points than papers because some papers were measuring different life history traits or even presenting data from, uh, from different insect species. Okay. And finally, you can see in the last column the number of species, 14 species of heteropterans, 13 species of aphids, one single species of whitefly. Quite, uh, quite disappointing. And for aphids, um, there's 13 species of aphids in this meta-analysis, but 89%, uh, 90% of the data comes from a couple of species, the P aphid and the black bean aphid. Um, so as, as flown feeders, there's also psyllids and millibugs. No, only a couple of papers on psyllids, none of millibugs, so we couldn't do any meta-analysis on that. It's, we don't know why, maybe because no one has got enough interest on these groups, or maybe because curing the symbionts experimentally in these groups is very difficult, so no one has published this, uh, <laughs> these uh, problems of uh, curing the insects. As I've said, quite some diversity in terms of heteropterum species, only Bemisia tabasi in terms of the white flies. And Bemisia tabasi is a very important pest with quite some different biotypes, so some of them can be even considered as different species, but still quite related phylogenetically speaking. and in aphids, quite good data, but limited to a couple of aphids. And sometimes in one of the aphids, the black bean aphid, for example, almost all data comes from a single laboratory in Switzerland. So the infer what we can infer is quite limited sometimes. Next. So this is the, the for to answer the second question. Um, no, it's still the first question. I wanted to just show you this circular plot which shows the whole data set. And um, what we represent here is like the zero uh, in, in the white flies, which are in yellow, you can see the, the, y, uh, the y axis, which is the effect size. You can see that the zero is represented by this continuous line. Okay, so every point here is a data set that we, a data point that we extracted uh, with, um, from the papers. And if the values are below zero, it means that the symbionts are costly. If they are above, it means they are uh, beneficial. So we can see, for example, that for white flies, we have much less data than for aphids. That's another useful thing of this type of representation. And we can also see on the, on the legend, nicely colored, um, that the different life history traits are represented in different colors. So we can see the traits that we have uh, explored in this, uh, in this study. If we check, for example, aphids, we see that there's quite some negative values which are below zero, below this continuous line. And we have a lot of, of, uh, of points which are in, in, uh, in green. These are costs in terms of fecundity. But if we go to the other side, we go up, 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 and we get above zero, we see a lot of purple points, which are survival to parasitism. This is the benefit that the aphids can get from, from uh, the symbionts, from uh, protection against natural enemies, for example. I'll go into more details after that in, by summarizing the data. It's just to, to give you a general overview. Maybe the most interesting thing from this, uh, from this uh, representation is that in heteropterans, we have maybe 10, 15 negative values 
And then after that, we have an explosion of positive effects and of very large effect sizes. This suggests that in many cases, these symbionts in heteropterans are super beneficial, are so beneficial that we think that most of this, uh, in most of these species, the symbionts are in fact obligatory. We don't think that most of the insects would survive in nature without the symbiont. We've got quite some cases in which mortality was larger than 50% when the symbiont was removed. These insects, you can keep them in the lab, but I'm not sure they would survive in nature. Next. So this is like probably more clear and more, uh, more synthetic, where we have summarized the data from the circular plot for the different um, study groups. You can see in the horizontal line uh, the effect size, the effect sizes for each of the different groups, for heteropterans, for white flies, and for aphids. And in the y-axis, you see the different life history traits that we have studied. As I've said before, for heteropterans, if you see, if you take a look at the scale of the effect size for heteropterans, the scale goes from zero to six, whereas for the others, for aphids and whiteflies, it goes, it never goes higher than one. So effect sizes in heteropterans are huge. The losing the symbionts imposes strong costs, so carrying them is really, really beneficial. So that's what is represented here. An important note is about development time. Um, we transform development time as the inverse value. So a positive effect, a beneficial effect, we have considered a beneficial effect as a shorter development time because usually insects that develop faster, they can escape uh, natural enemies, uh, they can more easily escape from natural enemies or escape from abiotic, uh, adverse abiotic conditions. So we consider that short development times is a good thing. And for that, we just transform the effect sizes by multiplying by, by minus one. Um, then for white flies, um, well, for white flies, for Bemisia tabasi, because it all comes from a single species, we can see that there's a clear positive effect for, for fecundity and for development time, but there's no, apparently there's no associated costs to carrying these symbionts. It's only beneficial. What we think it's possible in this situation is that these facultative symbiotes are in fact kind of assisting nutrition in the insect. And as it has been found in some aphids recently, some facultative symbionts can complement the obligatory symbiont in acquisition of amino acids from the, from the diet. So we think that it's possible that this is what's happening in Bemisia tabasi, that these symbionts are in fact uh, only having a positive effect because they, they are kind of uh, nutritional or helping the insect to deal with, uh, with, uh, with the phloem sap, which is quite poor in nutrients. And then if we take a look at the aphids, the third column, then we see uh, in agreement with our hypothesis, there's a trade-off between fecundity and resistance to parasitic wasps. So you can see that when these aphids carry these facultative symbionts, they produce less offspring. And this is quite bad, carrying a bacteria that it makes you less fertile or less fecund. But then you get a benefit in terms of uh, resistance against natural enemies. And if I was an aphid, I would prefer to be less fecund, but when a natural enemy comes around, I am protected because natural enemies, specifically uh, parasitic wasps, uh, are very efficient uh, natural enemies of aphids. This is why they are very commonly used in, in biocontrol programs. A single female wasp can, uh, can attack like 100 aphids in a colony and completely um, eliminate a colony from a plant. So we think that this is probably the most interesting result of the meta-analysis that even if there are some papers that have studied in specific situations this trade-off, we know can now demonstrate that this, uh, in, by considering all the data that we have for aphids, this trade-off is, is, is present. Next. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just to, to tackle the, the third question on whether symbiont effects are species dependent, we could only analyze this for aphids because it's the only group we had enough, uh, enough data. And the answer is that yes, the, 
the effect is a species dependent and it's quite interesting also because if you take a look at the bottom part of the graph in parasitism you will see that there's three aphids here ap which is the p aphid af which is the black bean aphid the p aphid is the picture uh, bottom left the next one is the black bean aphid then it's citobian aveni which is the grain aphid sa so this aphid is an important pest too but its symbionts do not protect it against uh, parasitic wasps as you can see in the bottom part of the graph and if you take a look at the effects on fecundity it's quite interesting that cytobium abene the sa has no is no paying any cost of carrying the symbionts on the other hand of AF and AP, the P aphid and the black bean aphid, they are paying a cost in terms of fecundity for carrying the symbionts. So again, we can see that this trade-off in terms of defense and, and, and fitness is species dependent. Overall, we found an effect, but if we go into the details of the P aphid, we see that P aphids are protected from natural enemies, but they pay a cost, black bean aphids too, and the cetagone have any, no, at least with the studies that have been conducted so far. Next. So now there's another table here which shows basically the same, the effect size for lifespan, fecundity, and parasitism for the different semen species. Not much happening here. Um, if we take a look at the bottom part again in terms of parasitism, we see clearly Hamiltonella defensa is defensive. This is the first semen that has been found to be defensive and there has been Lots of studies uh, on this symbiont, so our meta-analysis tells us what we already knew, that Hamiltonella is a defensive symbiont. Rickettsia is also defensive, but what is a bit surprising is that when we take a look at the costs in terms of fecundity, only Rickettsia is costly, but not Hamiltonella defensa. Probably this is because there are some Hamiltonellas which are not very defensive so maybe they are not very costly but this is something that we cannot really say with a lot of uh, uh, we don't have a strong arguments to to really test this uh, across all the all the different studies that we put in the meta analysis next so to summarize um which groups have been sufficiently experimentally examined for the effects of symbionts on the host enough data for aphids and heteropterans we only have one species of whitefly, so we need more studies on different whitefly species. We don't have any data for psyllids and millibugs. For the second question on whether there is a trade-off between costs and benefits, yes, in aphids, and mostly driven by Hamiltonella in pea and black bean aphids. But there's no trade-off in whiteflies and heteropterans as we only found beneficial effects. And we think that in heteropterans, the effects here are extremely positive on cements, so these cements are likely to be obligatory and not facultative. And the third question is whether these cements are effects are species dependent. We only have data for aphids, and most uh, cements that are protective are also costly, but mostly in P aphids and black bean aphids. And the most clearly defensive cements are Hamiltonella and Rickettsia. And here we know we lack a lot of data on multiple infections because, as I've said, carrying only one facultative symbiont is more the exception than the rule. And we need to know what happens when these symbionts are in communities with other symbionts. There are some papers that are considering these interactions, but um, not enough to be included in the meta analysis. Next. Yeah, here I wanted to present a couple of slides. Um, on my current research, because I'm not doing much work on symbiosis now, and I would I took the advantage to present another of uh, Karim's project on his uh, PhD project, which is on the experimental community ecology. We basically are now getting interested in making quite complex communities. Karim has done experiments with uh, in mesocosm cages. And microcosm cages, sorry, um, with replicating these communities and then manipulating the communities, for example, removing higher order predators like the Nesidiocoris bolusor predator, or removing uh, some herbivores. And then we wanted to know how this can affect um, suppression over 
over the herbivores and plant health, but also because we did these experiments in the long term during uh, several several months, we wanted to test how these communities are more or less stable depending on the interactions at the, at the natural enemy level. Next. And maybe my of, one of my future dreams would be to include some symbionts in these systems. We already published a study a few years ago about how these symbionts can alter community dynamics, but we would like to do that in a more complex situation and see how this can alter um, bottom-up and top-down interactions in, in complex communities. Next and last. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know if you enjoyed it or you are just sleeping because I don't see anyone, but I hope you enjoyed it. Again, a big thank to Sharon Zitinska who lead this project and Karin Tihiwart, and who is currently in, in, in Sirat, in La Reunion, where I was before. And, uh, and uh, of course, a big thank to, um, to the cost action, because uh, this project is, uh, is product of this, um, this, this meta-analysis is part of this, of this uh, large project. Thank you very much. And we even have people clapping, so I don't know where this is in your... Uh... Yes, because, because I'm giving the talk in my institute, okay. and there's like 10 people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, someone says great talk, so I guess people like the talk. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&R uh, thing, so I can read them for you. Some, uh, Alexandra is asking how to distinguish obligate, or oh, you can read them too, but... Uh, um, Perhaps uh, Alexandra can also turn on her microphone or some, someone can turn it on for her if she wants to react. Uh, but I start asking the question. Oh, Alexandra? Um, I can ask, so how to distinguish obligate from facultative symbionts if you don't know it from the literature? Is it experimentally? If it doesn't survive without a specific bacteria or any other clues, how do you define obligate versus non-obligate, basically? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> well, uh, the very the, the easiest thing to distinguish um, uh, if a symbiont is obligatory is by removing it and then checking uh, if the insect survives. So if it, the insect dies, then it's obligatory. Um, if you want to know something about a specific species to know if the symbiont is obligatory or facultative, if it's an aphid, a white fly, a psit, or a millibug, I'm telling you that each one of them carries an obligatory symbiont that is obligatory because when these species diverged, they acquired the symbiont and then thanks to this acquisition, they managed to colonize new, 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 uh, new ecological niches. For sting bugs or other species, I guess you, are, you have to manipulate with antibiotics or you can do a more genomic approach where you check if the symbionts provide essential amino acids and then you can guess they are obligatory, but the experimental demonstration is always the best uh, answer. Uh, just to follow up, so Alexandra, if you're happy with the, you can react if you want to say more. Uh, I'm wondering, is there such thing as an obligate symbiont for reproduction? Like not obligate for survival, but you need them in some way. To, is there cases like this? Or? Well, I mean, I guess that if you don't reproduce, you don't survive. Um, well, you could survive and not reproduce. Yeah, but but and this is still a obligate, but I think yeah, it's an evolutionary dead end. I mean, yeah. you can survive, but at the end, uh, the species. Yeah, that's, will, uh, that's why I'm but, asking if you are aware of any case like this. Um, well, Volvacia, if we think about sexual manipulators, Volvacia is the is the clear example. But Volvacia is mostly making uh, many insects uh, reproduce only producing females, so that Volvacia is a kind of a, was considered as a selfish element that makes sure that, she's, that the bacteria is transmitted always. More than this... Uh, well, okay, don't worry, it wasn't really in the question, so I was just... Afraid. Okay. <laughs> so there's a question by Bessem, who's asking, uh, um, saying that in aphids, the benefits seem related, are related to protection and asking if there was any work that looked at the tipping point below which it's more advantageous to lose the symbiont, even in the presence of natural enemies, 
In other words, did someone look at the enemy's density below which uh, having a protection is uh, more costly than beneficial, yeah. basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, there is a paper, a Proceedings B paper by Christoph Borburger, team. Uh, we always refer to the senior author because we remember the person, but it was done by someone else. I don't remember the name. Um, um, where they tested, they had a battery of PA feeds with different Hamiltonellas that had different levels of protection. Um, some of these Hamiltonellas were even uh, non-protective. We know that there are some symbols, some Hamiltonellas that they are there, but they don't protect against natural enemies. And they tested this hypothesis of whether more protective ones were more costly. And they found no correlation. So it, the, the story is more complicated than we think because the symbiont can be super protective and not very costly or not very protective and very co costly. But these studies have been done in the lab against a single wasp species. And we know also from other studies um, that some symbionts can protect against uh, against some some symbiont, some Hamiltonella strains can protect against some parasitoids and some other strains protect against other parasitoids. So it's difficult to know in nature when carrying the symbiont is useful or not because also natural enemy densities change a lot during the year. So I'm not sure I can answer the question uh, very precisely. But it but seems, the uh, that, sorry, just to follow up, it seems yeah. that uh, you could, uh, from your computation of the cost and benefits, you could uh, just, uh, you know, um, even with a model, just assess at which uh, frequency uh -huh. of encounter, you, it becomes, <clears throat> like if you never yeah. encounter uh, um, uh, the, the parasite, yeah. then you just have the cost. Basically. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that what would be very interesting is to know the ecology of these of these aphids. Like, if you live in a, an environment where there's less natural enemy pressure, then carrying a costly symbiont, expecting that at some point you will be attacked, would be quite uh, not very useful. There's some work done in, in England, too, in Oxford, where they tested that. Huh? They put um, aphids in different host plants. And these different host plants are known to carry different symbionts, and they explored whether the, in these plants there was more natural enemy pressure. The results were a bit uh, mixed. So some, some of the results supported their hypothesis, saying that, yes, there's more pressure of natural enemies in this plant, that there's more symbionts. But in some other plants, it doesn't. So, mm. so Bessem is here. So, is it? Are you happy with the answer? Yeah, yeah. We no can problem. move on. Okay. Uh, then uh, Pradeep uh, is asking. Um, so, uh, Emmanuel, sorry, is it? Are you the one giving them the? Oh, okay. Yes. Pradeep, if you want, you can ask your question. If you turn on your microphone. So. Uh, nice talk, actually. Uh, it's audible. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Hello. Hello. Okay, so it seems to have problems, but he's asking Hello. whether, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, whether oleander aphid uh, adap adapted to milkweed toxin is dependent on symbionts or independent of symbionts. Yeah. You know, um, hey, uh, Pradeep, uh, we cannot hear you very well, but I can, I can read your question. Um, so, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess that the usual procedure in these situations, I've seen, I've seen some papers where they have uh, explored these kind of questions, not with aphids scenario, where they have collected aphids from different plants. Uh, I don't remember the model system. It was not P aphids, not black bean aphids. It was not others. It's not as another species. I don't remember the name, but they collected aphids from two different host plants, and they found that in one of the host plants, there was always one facultative symbiont present. And when you see that, of course, it doesn't, it's not, you cannot do that only with two populations. Eh? You have to find replicated populations in replicated plants 
in different landscapes and separated in space to avoid the, the spatial autocorrelation on these effects. If you always find that one of the symbols is always present in one plant, then you can start to wondering, hmm, maybe that's the effect. And then if you do genomics on this plant, on this symbiont, then you find that the symbiont has the capability of, of digest uh, milkweed toxins, then you have a nice story. But uh, yeah, first I would start by collecting the insects, maybe then curing them and trying to feed them on the plant where they are usually present and see if there's a fitness cost. And then you can start looking at the, at the, yeah, the link between the symbiont and the plant. Okay, so then uh, Lucy is asking, uh, saying great talk and asking, do you have in your meta study? Uh, okay, so basically the question, I guess, is whether um, some of these facultative symbionts are in bacteriomes and others in gut. Uh, I, I thought the bacterium was only for the obligate, but perhaps you can correct this. Yeah. If, if yes, any observation on gut symbionts and which one are more beneficial? Yeah. Or yeah, that's a tricky question also. Huh? So in aphids, uh, white flies, uh, mealybugs, usually symbionts are in bacteriums. Even if all these groups, they also carry bacteria in the guts, but not this highly evolved bacteria that uh, provide essential amino acids. Um, then in the sting bugs, in the heteropterans, most of these symbionts are in the guts. But in many situations, so one thing that I haven't said during the, the talk is that when we started analyzing the database for sting bugs, we had many cases in where the sting bugs, the heteropterans, removal of the symbiont led to more than 70% of mortality. These studies were not included. It was our arbitrary decision. These studies were not included in the meta-analysis because we considered that more than 70% mortality is an obligatory symbiont. The symbionts are in the guts, sometimes in small crypts. So I would say that these are super intimate interactions that are almost as intimate as in aphids, maybe a bit less because these bacteria have lost less genes and so on, but they are super intimate. So in terms of gut symbionts, there's a nice gradient between uh, very uh, obligatory to quite facultative but most of them are quite uh, needed for the insect to have a decent fitness. Uh, so uh, Raquel is asking, uh, what are the limitations of your studies, sir? And I would add to this, if I can, um, that you mentioned uh, in the description that uh, you have to deal with publication biases, de-hacking, etc. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but how do you account for this? And also, uh, did you account for the error in this uh, measurement that you use with, with the figures where you have to, uh, you know, yeah. extract the data? So I guess this sort of uh, goes with the same. Um, yeah. This so is maybe. The technical side, and perhaps there are other limitations she had in mind she can react. Yeah. Well, um, well for, for the most deep uh, limitations that we have is what I've already mentioned. We were saying things about white flies based on a single species. And we have some significant p-values that we consider significant that come for only five, six data points coming for two, three papers. So this is quite limited because it's quite limited to a, to a single, uh, single paper. Or sometimes we say a lot of things about some aphids that studies all come from the same laboratory. So these are limitations that we mentioned in the paper, which is now uh, under review. And um, But I wouldn't say it's a limitation. It's The limitation is the data that it's out there. And as long as when you write a meta-analysis, you are saying, hey, this is what we have. This is what a meta-analysis is, is about. Meta-analysis is about saying we don't have enough data in this species or in this uh, system, so future researchers can try to fill this gap. For the for the publication bias and the p hacking, we tested it in all our models, so we didn't have any evidence for for publication bias or p hacking. I've done another analysis, another meta analysis, another Sorry, project. Uh, can you just explain very briefly how this is done if people are interested? Because I guess lots of people do. Yeah. Um, so basically, well, that's a tough question. No, so if it's short, if you can do it shortly. 
So the, the P hacking is very simple. You just draw a curve on your P values. And usually you have to have a few P values of 0 0.04, a few more of 0 0.03, and quite a lot of P values which are very small. If you have, no, sorry, it's the opposite. Most of the p-values are very small, and only few p-values are close to 0 0.05. If you have the opposite, it means that you have done an experiment, the p-value was 0 0.06. Oh, I want the 0 0.04. You repeat the experiment, you repeat until you get the 0 0.04, and then you publish that. And that's so it's an happy. excess of p-values close to 0 0.05. Yes, so there's more p-values close to 0 point, just in between 0 0.04 and 0 0.05 than there should be. Okay. And the publication bias is when only very significant effects are published. So when you see like, uh, like the variation in your, in your data in some p-values is larger when there's more, uh, let me see if I say it well, you have more variation in your um, in your um, in your effect sizes in the less significant effects so you have you have a plot which you have a kind of triangle and the dots should be inside it's like a kind of a normal curve um, so um, we already had a question from alexandra so uh, nicolas sauvion is uh, saying a comment about bemisia tabazzi which is in fact a complex of species as you mentioned and uh, thinks there might be a risk of biasing the results by not uh, treating these species, yeah. uh, subspecies separately. So uh, Ni uh, Nicola perhaps can uh, expand on this or react to your, so what do you think? Uh, Nicola cannot talk. Okay, so well, anyway, um, then okay. Henry, no, I, I, I can, I understand the question and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. In fact, we haven't thought about it and that would be quite simple to include just as we did for P aphids, I for aphids that we separated between species of aphids, we could separate between um, Bemisia tabasi biotypes. There's the Mediterranean, the, there's three, four biotypes. If I remember well, yeah, the problem is that we don't have much data from white flies. So even subsetting it into, uh, into biotypes is, is, is going to be complicated. And also not all studies provide the biotype. Many studies just said Bemisia tabasi. So one, one important message about meta-analysis, doing a meta-analysis is that when you publish a paper, experimental paper, try to think about the person that will someday do a meta-analysis and try to give all information in a clear way. <laughs> so it saves time. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so guess perhaps one last question by Alexandra, uh, since you did all these different uh, orders or taxa. So what about beetles? Where are the symbiotes in beetles i think i think uh, alexander you need to read our book chapter <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean it's, it's not uh, it, it's not freely freely available but just send me an email i'll send you the whole book if you want i hope the editors are not in the audience um, <laughs> uh, but i'll send it to you because it's our effort even if you are supposed to pay uh, i'll send it to you for free so in beetles um okay let me think well, there's a lot of, of evidences in beetles. There's uh, important research done in the States, also in Germany. And most symbiotes in beetles are in the guts. Uh, but I think there are some examples of tortosia beetles which are inside the body. I don't remember exactly, but mostly they are in the guts. And so you have, for a, example, you have the information somewhere otherwise. If you... Yes, yes. Check uh, we, we in, in our review we did quite some quite some we cited quite some of these papers, but I don't remember every every single the, the paper has more than two hundred references, so it's a lot of information there, and um, but they are mostly in the guts, and uh, these uh, in the guts uh, what the insect eats, then um, these uh, these microbes can help can assist in digestion, but in beetles one very important thing that came in our in our review is that there's not many obligatory symbionts in beetles because many beetles have acquired genes from beetles and they have incorporated into their own genomes by horizontal gene transfer. 
So they, instead of keeping the bacteria with them, they have acquired the genes that they were interested in and they keep them for themselves. So beetles are one of these cases where we think symbionts are not super, uh, are not like always there helping in digestion because most of the genes were acquired by horizontal gene transfer. This is one of the key points of the, our review tool. All right, uh, I think we should, uh, we can stop here. So someone was asking about uh, where you can get the video. So uh, do you agree that this video is shared for your talk? Or is it yes, I think my hair is not looking that bad. Yeah. Okay, nothing uh, very confidential. So uh, someone can uh, step in and remind people of, like Alison or Emmanuel, uh, where can you get the video again? Is it from Agrinia? Or is it on the website of the LabEx? The last time we published the video, we were sent the video on Monday that we put on the LabEx webpage. But okay. to access it, you need to put the date of last week, of this cut week, because otherwise it just updates to the most recent date. For example, on Monday, they'll only have it from showing dates from Monday, but you can put the date back to today to see um, Frago's poster, where we'll put the link. All right, not sure I understood, but it will be available at, well, you'll on see, the LabEx website. Yes, it'll be available on the LabEx website, but you'll need to find Frago's poster to yeah. access it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. All right, okay, so uh, thanks again, Eric, and uh, thanks everyone. And I guess we'll see you next week, Friday, same time, unless it's someone from the, I think it's still a uh, normal time next week. Bye-bye, have okay. a nice weekend. Friday is at four. Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, so next week, oh, it's at four because it's someone from the US. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice week. Bye-bye.